In this video, I'm diving into the art of drawing wood for wood turning. I'll walk you through not only the how, but the when and the why of how to dry bowl, spindle and platter blanks. Based on my years of learning from expert wood turners, I want to pass on crucial steps of when it comes to right at the start of processing your timber. Plus, I'll share some personal insights that could make all the difference in your projects. So let's get started with those crucial steps. When you are processing your timber, you have to get rid of all the defects out of the timber before you start drying. They'll only come back to haunt you. And what I mean by that is you want to get rid of all the decay, any rot within the timber, any weak or, or crumbly timber. You want to get that out of it straight away. Any big knots as well. Because I found that when I would just try and save every piece of timber only cost me a lot of money down the track having to rectify those defects. The second most important thing you want to do is get rid of the pith, the centermost growth ring of the tree. Getting rid of that will stop any future cracking down the track and will set you in good stead for air drying your timber. For us visual learners, I just wanted to make a demonstration of what I mean by removing the pith so it's easier to understand. So this log is in our yard. The first thing I do when I go to process my logs, uh, I remove any end grain checking. I'll put a picture on the screen of what end grain checking looks like. I normally go up the log about four to six inches, especially Australian hardwoods, it cracks a lot. So once, it, once I remove majority of it, if there's maybe one prominent crack, I'll leave it and then continue on. When I do continue on, more, all my bowl blanks that I harvest out of the tree when they're big enough and I'm able to are 16 inches. So I go down the log 16 inches for the size of blank that I want. So 16 inches down, I'll then cut it and then I'm ready to start processing. Once I go to mark it up, if there's a prominent crack like I said earlier, I use that to my advantage. I run my ruler down that line and that becomes the center point of the tree that I mark all my measurements off. Once I'm there, I mark an inch either side of the pith and then I go down six inches and that's my bowl blank and then down six inches that side and make a line. I then get the saw and I remove these side pieces like so. I then chalk up the blank up the log like that so it keeps it nice and sturdy and safe. I then run my saw down these lines not all the way through and then down that side but not all the way through. Once I'm happy and everything's safe and sturdy I then nip them off and then they fall apart like that. This is the center part of the tree, the pith. That's it there but this isn't waste. I measured down the pith line but that there is the section you want to remove out of everything and that becomes that becomes firewood. I mark either side of the pith like this and they are my platter blanks and the reason why these lines here are the growth rings and you might notice compared to this piece these growth rings are vertical they're quite vertical and straight and that will enable you to make really nice platters that won't cup up on the table when, when they're drying or they age. They'll stay nice and flat and sturdy. Quarter saw material is the best material, but once it's dried and, and, and turned, it's, it's beautiful stuff. So then they become my platter blanks. These two pieces here that fell out of the sides are my bowl blanks. So they're normally 15 inches in diameter by five or six inches deep. So they are my bowl blanks. I mark them up and then take it all over to the bandsaw. So now I'd like to show you another little quick tip in step three. When you are processing your blanks out in the yard or wherever with your chainsaw, cover them with a the tarp at all times. I find here in Australia, processing timber in the winter when the timber is a little bit dormant in Australia, but overseas where you get a true winter, the timber is dormant and not seeking moisture. So that is the best time to harvest your, your bowl blanks because the timber is not stressed and looking for water. So you might be thinking, why do I need to seal the end grain? And I choose to use a PVA wood glue, which I'll talk about just a sec of how I actually apply it. But when you cut and then turn your bowl blanks on the lathe, 
the timber is going through rapid changes in moisture, being exposed to air, and the most vulnerable part of the timber is the end grain there. So you wanna seal that, and it acts like a protective shield, like a second skin to the timber, and not allowing that air to get to the timber, and it slows down the moisture evaporation. So I use a PVA wood glue, I use it straight, and how I go about applying it, you wanna identify the end grain where the growth rings start to get really circular up towards the top. So the end grain here and here on the tree, and you, you paint that section with the PVA wood glue. Some people choose to put it around the top of the rim. Uh, I don't, I don't see the need for it. Other people might choose to use a paraffin wax, an anchor seal and paint. I've used all of those before previously. I choose to just use PVA wood glue and paint it on neat on the end grains only of my bowl blanks. With platters, I cover the whole thing. When I rough turn these platters, so I've cut, coated the whole platter with the PVA wood glue, and then I set that aside, and I sticker them up with roughly one inch by one inch stickers. And that allows good ample airflow through the timber blanks. When it comes to spindle blanks, I cover the end grain only on the spindle blanks and set them aside and stack them up. And that allows the end grain to not crack and be exposed to air and it dries them nice and slowly for me. Two quick little things I wanna mention before we move on is when you are coring all your bowls out, I always write the date on the bottom of the bowl. Another little handy tip is I just write a number on the top of the bowl. And when I stack them up, I write maybe, for example, one, 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 one on all the bowls. And I put them aside in my air drying under a shelter that isn't exposed to direct heaps of sunlight and lots of wind. When I write all those numbers on there, I then come into my workshop and then write them on the whiteboard. One represents, for example, January. And from there, I know that all that stack with the ones is January. That enables me, so when I come back later on and I check the moisture of the January bowls and I find that they're not drying out as quick as maybe the February or the March bowls, I know that I might need to adjust their location or move them around slightly. So it just allows me a little bit more control and keeps me well informed of how they're drying. Plus, when you've got hundreds of bowls drying, you want to know which ones were which. When I stack and sticker and stack them. Sometimes with the main bowl, I make the foot quite wide, so it just allows them to sit on the concrete or on the ground nice and sturdy. If I don't, I grab two stickers and then slide them underneath, and that just gives them a little bit more stability when they're, when they're stacked all the way up. So how long should it take for my blanks to dry? And now, there is a lot of rules out there that people say that it takes one year per inch but that rule doesn't work right across the, the, the globe. So for instance, here in Australia where I live, in Queensland, it's beautiful one day, better the next, one inch of timber dries within four months, four to six months, all dependent on what period of the year that they're drying through. And like I said earlier, I try and dry my blanks and harvest them through the winter period into the summer period. So they're not at stress as much. And that's why I say to monitor and make a record of constantly going out, when I say constantly, every couple of weeks, go out and check how your blanks are going. And then that'll give you a greater idea of how it works within your area. You could always jump on social media and ask other wood turners within your area if there is others, and they'll be able to give you an indication of time frames. But the age old thing that I say all the time is to go down to your local wood turning club and they will be, there's a, there are a plethora of knowledge down there and they'll be able to point you in the right direction. So I just want to quickly talk about moisture meters and I own two moisture meters. Reason why is I take an average. So I check with one and check with the other and then take the average. I then record the moisture on my whiteboard sheet and that just allows me to keep a constant idea of how everything's going, how it's tracking. Do I need to move a stack around? Do I need to adjust it? And it just gives me a greater control of air drying 
and when I am checking the moisture, I'm looking for any cracks or defects, things like that. Just making sure they're not getting exposed to too much wind or if they're getting exposed to moisture or something like that, sunlight. I can then adjust it accordingly. And you will find that when they do dry, they will go oval. So the side grain will pull in and the end grain will stand up. But that's just the just way they are. And that's why I allow for an inch thickness all the way down to the bottom. But the most important thing is to enjoy the process and monitor the blanks as they're moving along. Now you know how to dry your timber bowl blanks. There is four different ways of how to remount them on the lathe and I've made a video just here that will walk you through each step professional wood turners use to finish their bowl blanks. So I will see you there, talk to you directly. Cheers.